welcome back to my channel. So today, in this video, we are going to be interviewing the legendary Jack Selby, one of the original members of the PayPal Mafia, which is the core team that made PayPal. A tip and company that now allows us to send money online and safely. So, one of get let's start it. And when I met Peter, I realized I'd met a very, 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 very smart person. And at the end of the day, I think the network that you can create during your life is truly your best asset. Do you want to be the next Elon Musk? Then great, go out and try to launch some rockets in outer space and raise a lot of money and do something that's crazily audacious. So I have a joke that if I ever write a book, the, the title of the book, be the dumbest guy in the room. And then the tagline below that is that the trick is getting in the room. So here guys we with the legendary Silicon Valley entrepreneur and investor, Jack Selby. He is the managing director of Peter Till's family office. Peter Till doesn't really need an introduction, but a family office is pretty much just how billionaires manage their money. Jack Selby is also one of the first employees to join PayPal, the ninth one. Correct. Right. Jack Selby is also an investor that was associated with huge tech companies such as SpaceX, Palantir, and so many more. Jack Selby is also in the film industry. It is an honor and pleasure to be with you. Thank you, son. Thank you. And welcome to the show. Thank you, son. Pleasure. Thank you. Can you share with us your background in the tech industry? What inspired you to get into it? And what made you want to do this huge leap of faith from when you were in Germany as a banker to go all the way to California to join PayPal? Sure. No, I, uh, I've had a very lucky and fortunate path over the years. And so I met Peter... Oh goodness, back in, uh, I think it was the fall of 1998. Uh, and it was, uh, it was happenstance, but right. I was very lucky. And he had this idea, which in effect was the predecessor to the predecessor of what would evolve into PayPal. And uh, he basically convinced me to essentially quit my job and move out to California and uh, help him get this company off the ground. And it was, it was very uh, fortuitous timing. Uh, my younger brother was just starting to play American football uh, at Stanford. And so it, would, uh, it made it a lot easier to watch his games living in Palo Alto. And uh, this was back when uh, the dot-com era, well before your time, your father could relate, uh, but a uh, long time ago. And right. so- Before all of, 2013. No, no, yeah. Well before then, yes. Uh, this was 1998, so. Uh, but yes, yeah, so I moved out and uh, joined Peter, as you said, employee number nine, and I ended up running the, the corporate and the international operations uh, at the company, and uh, it was a, an amazing experience. Right. So you really just felt that, you felt that Peter was just taking you on, was influencing you. You just felt right with the idea of that. You just felt right of when he was taking you with him. You just felt it so it was um it was one of these experiences i was very young when i met peter i think i was uh 24 or 25 and when i met peter i realized i'd met a very 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 smart person and so i vowed at that point to try to hold on for dear life and so fast forward now today i've been holding on for goodness almost 25 years but i just got very lucky to meet such a talented an extraordinary person at such a young point in my career. Thank you. <laughs> and as a successful entrepreneur, what key lessons have you learned throughout your journey in the tech industry? And what advice do you have for people who want to get into this industry? Good question. So I think the one common denominator that we have seen uh, during all of our different investing, uh, both good and bad, is that it's all about the entrepreneur. It's the, the jockey, as they say, not the horse. So it all begins and ends with the entrepreneur. And so, you know, we've been very blessed to have worked in the past with a lot of very talented people that have gone on to start companies like SpaceX and LinkedIn and YouTube and the list goes on and on. 
So we're just very, very blessed. And my, my joke that I like to say is that I think of many of the many skills that Peter has, which they're infinite, is, is probably his best skill when we were doing PayPal was as a hiring manager, myself notably excluded, uh, but he hired a lot of really, really talented people. And at the end of the day, I think the network that you can create during your life is truly your best asset. And again, I got very, very uh, lucky by being such a talented person at a very uh, early point in my career. And you've been involved in investing in tech startups. What specific criteria do you look for on when you try and find a startup to invest in? Yes, that's a great question as well. So I think um, as an investor, I think I personally have a preference for entrepreneurs that have been an entrepreneur before. So in other words, someone who was a first time entrepreneur, that's a, an added level of risk because you don't know if the person um, has the intestinal fortitude to be an entrepreneur because sometimes uh, you know, when you're going on an entrepreneurial experience, you may have many, many, many uh, almost near death experiences. So, and that can be very challenging mentally. And so some people go, should go on a career where like, let's say you become a, a junior lawyer at a very good law firm and you should just start as a junior associate and become the CEO of the law firm 30 years later. And that's a great career path. But being an entrepreneur is much different because as you go up, you have these down cycles where it's like a near death experience and it can, um, it can be very challenging. And if you're not, if you don't have the temperament for that, um, it's not a good fit. So I think uh, trying to figure out what is the best path for anyone at any given time is really important. And what is your message for people who want to get into the tech industry? So I think, you know, as I said to the last question, I think it's a question of what do you want to do? Do you want to create something or do you want to join a firm that is kind of your lifelong ambition? So maybe you want to go work at a Ramco and you're going to want to go work at the best energy company in the world which it truly really is. And so you could go there as a young uh, junior person and you could climb the ranks and, and literally work at one of the best companies in the world. And that's fantastic. But if you also want to be an entrepreneur, then you could go off on your own and try to experiment with ideas, but you'll probably have some failures along the way. And then you have to realize that when you have those failures, how do you bounce back from those failures? And that can be very challenging. So it just depends on what you want to do and what you want to choose as a young person. So you think that we should just follow our own way, follow the street? Yes. And so I think you should just follow your guts in terms of the path that you want to uh, follow. And so no path is better or worse, but just kind of trust what you want to do. So do you want to be the next Elon Musk? Then great. Go out and try to launch some rockets in outer space and raise a lot of money and do something that's crazily audacious. Right. And what current trends do you find the most interesting in the tech industry right now? Yes. So I think uh, right now in the tech industry, uh, it's very different from what it was, uh, say, a couple of years ago. So before you were born, there was something called the Great Financial Crisis. And so after the Great Financial Crisis, uh, the interest rates were very, very low. And so getting money was relatively easy. And so because of that, there were all sorts of different tech companies that were getting started that were essentially science experiments, which is great because we always want experiments and try for new ideas. But a lot of these experiments didn't have any focus on cash flows or trying to get to profitability and so forth. And so now that interest rates are 5X of what they were during that period, uh, the cost of capital is much higher and the tolerance for these science experiments is much lower. So. I don't have a sector specific uh, answer to your question, but it's just very different now. I think businesses need to focus on being cash flow positive, getting to profitability, kind of pulling themselves up by the bootstraps much as early as possible. Whereas say five years ago, that was definitely not what was in vogue, if you will. What do you see as the most significant challenges that the tech industry is currently facing and how do you think that is going to be able to face them off? Hmm. That's interesting. So I think it depends on what context your question is in, but let's answer it in the context of geopolitics as an example. So I uh, spent a lot of time in China trying to figure out how we could be more involved in the China uh, kind of technology venture capital scene, if you will. And this was back in 2015, 2016, 17. And so spent a lot of time there, went there about once a month, met a lot of amazing people. 
but unfortunately, the geopolitics have become um, much more difficult. And so as an American, it's, it's harder for us to go there and invest in great companies. That being said, uh, if, I, if I had the ability to go to China and be an investor, I think it would be an amazing time because the China growth story, I think, has a long way to go. I still think it's, uh, if it's a baseball analogy, it's only the second inning. So it has a long, long way further. Um, and it would be a great opportunity, but I don't have that opportunity uh, as an American. And plus, I'm not Chinese. I don't speak Mandarin. So I don't think I uh, would be very good at that. But that I think that the China story is, uh, has a long way to go. Right. Emerging technologies like AI, blockchain, quantum computing are gaining speed. What do you think that these revolutionary technologies, how do you think are they going to shape the tech industry from now on? Sure. So I think AI, uh, artificial intelligence, is uh, probably the, the most buzzy of the various buzzwords. And uh, rightfully so, I think. And so my opinion is that there's going to be essentially um, a bifurcation. So on one hand, there are going to be very, very large kind of superpowers within the AI space. So I think the large tech corporates, so the Alibabas, the Microsofts, the Googles, Amazons and so forth. Um, and then Sam Altman and, and some of his brethren, uh, they will be very, very good in terms of revolutionizing the entire sector of artificial intelligence. That being said though, there's a constraint with artificial intelligence in the sense that there are only so many PhDs and scientists and engineers that are world-class to kind of push things forward with AI. And that's probably, you know, outside of China, that's probably, you know, in the thousands, not the tens of thousands. So it's a relatively finite universe. So, and those people are very, very expensive because there's so much in demand. So again, I think that will be, uh, that will be participated in by these very large groups, the big corporates and Sam Altman and equivalent. The other bit, the other bifurca bif bif bifurcation bit is that I think for VCs in general and tech startups is that AI will become ubiquitous. It will become pervasive. And so as an example with my Arizona Venture Fund, we've made, I think about 10 investments so far. And about three quarters of those investments have AI as a critical component of what the company does. Conversely, what about those other, you know, 25%, the other two or three companies that don't have the AI involved? And so when we look at investments, it's very critical to understand how AI is going to impact their business model. And if there's a good argument as to why AI will not impact it, then that's fine. We'll listen to it. And obviously we made a few investments based on that rationale. But I do think AI for the vast majority of companies within tech that VCs invest in, AI will be a component and ingredient in the overall recipe. So you think it's a new, it's a new ingredient that we're going to be using in all of our small recipe, all of our projects, all of our startups. So you think it's a new seed that we're going to grow in the tech in the, uh, in the farm, in the tech farm. Yeah, so I think uh, going forward uh, with technology companies, I think this will be an ingredient that will be in the vast majority of technology companies that get invested in by venture capital. So it's a new era? It's a new, well, it's, a new, it's at least a new ingredient. Maybe it's a new era. So you're mentioning about machine learning. Mm. And um, so do you think, how do you think, because do you think that people all use the same sample of data, the same amount of the same data to do everything in machine learning? Do you think that it's all representative for everyone? Or do you use many kinds of data for each person? So I think this goes back to the question uh, of how China and the US will approach artificial intelligence and uh, language models. So I think in China, because it's more of a controlled society, there will be better access to a larger data set. So I think that's a huge advantage that they have over uh, the United States. Conversely though, I think uh, the US uh, is a more open society and it's a bit more entrepreneurial with respect that anyone can do whatever they like. And so while we may not have the same universal data set that the equivalent would have in China, uh, we're free to do what we like. And how does that net out in terms of the better outcome? I'm not sure, but we'll see. Right, right. So for individuals working in the tech industry, what advice do you have for them to stay always in the game, not to get kicked out of the competition? <laughs> uh, that's an interesting question. I think the, the best, and this is uh, my advice, so it's a sample set of one, uh, but I think 
Your network is your net wealth. And so try to meet as many smart people as possible. So I have a joke that if I ever write a book, the, the title of the book, be the dumbest guy in the room. And then the tagline below that is that the trick is getting in the room. So in other words, I felt like when I was working at PayPal amongst kind of the executive staff, because we have so many talented people, I was the dumbest guy in the bunch, but I was lucky enough or skilled enough or some combination to figure out a way to get into that group. But it was a very, very much a blessing. Beyond the tech industry, you've been involved in philanthropy and charity many things. Yes. How do you think that the tech leaders of today are going to be using all this charity? How do you think that this that all the charity is going to be shaping the world from now on? So I think it's very important for people that have had success, whether it's coming out of tech or any other industry, it's very important to give back in a philanthropic way, however you see fit. And so, you know, so for my parents, my grandparents, you know, people would give uh, money to the museum or the opera or whatever it may be, and, that, and that's great. But I think today, especially as the wealth gap continues to widen, um, I think it's important to try to give back in any way that people feel uh, fits. So as an example, you could write a, a bigger tip when you go out to a dinner. That is a good way to give back to someone who's earning an hourly wage and maybe that's helpful. Right. Thank you so much for your beautiful insights and for your precious time. You're most welcome. Mr. Selby. You're welcome. Welcome to the family. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Great <Bravo. job. laughs> Amazing. Bravo, bravo. bravo. <laughs>